All right. There you go. So we are now live. <laughs> so I can a lot of people. Hindi naman. As long as our intention is, well, everyone will just visit this place. Anyway. Yes, we are used to it already. <laughs> it's fine. It's okay. <laughs> there are a lot of people outside. Hi guys. Hello. It's, it's already official. Official. No requirement of wearing masks. Oh yeah, I think so. Oh, yes. Anyway, so there are always temptation around. I did. I never contacted him, but I always have that track on the channel. But um, this is closer than me. So it's not like two places. Oh, okay. yeah. Far past his son, Dr. I do. I have part of the menu. I do a little bit. All right, so shall we start? Okay. <laughs> uh, I don't know if it's working online, but uh, anyway, let's 
let's begin. So we start with the prayer. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, Amen. Lord, our God and loving Father, we thank you for this uh, day, for this new grace, new life, new opportunity to love you and to know you more as we try to deepen our sense of reflection and meditation in this season of Lent. Accompany us and continue to guide us as we begin this recollection series, this Lenten season. And may we always be nourished by your inspiration, by your Holy Spirit to strengthen and to inspire us always to deepen our love and knowledge of your, of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. So good morning, uh, my dear sisters. Good morning, brothers, who are, will be watching later on <laughs> online. So our first theme for this first meeting uh, regarding this Lenten uh, recollection series, this Lenten season, is none other than, of course, temptation. <laughs> so temptation, uh, because we know exactly that uh, temptation is always lurking at our door, no? that is uh, always trying to prevent us from fulfilling something that is more noble, more um, good and more beautiful and more perfect no, in terms of our journey towards holiness. So l let us begin this uh, recollection by studying and knowing the very word temptation and with it, with it, uh, it originates. So there is no shortcut, of course, no? as we mentioned that last time, uh, shortcut to comfort popularity and power okay well there are really shortcuts to it but we know for sure that indeed um, they would all always lead us to destruction or to selfishness not really to maturity not really to a more deeper sense of commitment and self-sacrifice and self-giving in the context again in the context of Christian way of life Okay, so that is because temptation is always geared toward that kind of approach or direction, shortcut, instant, no? So for us to identify the very source, the very cause, okay, and the very direction and end of temptation, we have to answer the four questions here, the what, the when, and the who, and the why, all right? of the word temptation who is behind this temptation and when it happens okay and what it brings to us and why it is always in front of us all right so first temptation according to the description the definition of it is that it is a desire a very human of desire a desire to do something, especially something wrong or unwise. Okay, so when we speak about desire, this is always very common and very natural to every human being, regardless of status, regardless of, of course, stage, age, or situation in life. Everyone has always the desire human as we are so the desire whether it girds toward good or towards bad towards holiness or towards sinfulness fulfillment or failure or mistakes so this these are always you know uh, under the category of desire okay we of course we know that desire is not good per se because that is natural part of uh, being human. No? To have a desire is to be naturally human because if you don't have desire, I don't know, for sure you are not a human being. Maybe you are just an invention like a robot, no? Only being manipulated and controlled by, of course, by machine or by imparted memory, okay? or artificial knowledge, we call it, 
Or another one is a thing or a course of action. So aside from it is a desire, it is a course of action to be done. Okay, so this is always coupled again by, by free will. Course of action that attracts or tempts someone to do it or not to do it. To come or not to come. <laughs> Something like that. So it is a desire, one thing. Another is, it is a course of action. That's why temptation is always in this context. No? And then, of course, in the biblical sense, if we, like, if we would like to apply that in the biblical context, because I think the proper place where to apply the word temptation is always in the context of the people. Of course, tracing it from the beginning, how the people really became successful and end up in failure. For what purpose and what reason? What is the reason behind? So in the biblical word, temptation primarily denotes a trial mm -hmm. in which man has a free choice of being faithful or unfaithful to God. Primarily, that is the very definition of the word temptation in the biblical context, meaning in the context of the people. In the context of a group of people who are aspiring to achieve something or to fulfill a particular goal in life. Alright? Or being faithful to God. Only secondary. Okay? Secondary does it signify allurement or seduction to sin. That's why uh, sometimes it's not just enough to well, immediately have a kind of um, immediate understanding of the word uh, temptation. But if we try to dig deeper to this particular definition, we can see much bigger and much deeper kind of meaning. Okay? And so it's not just easy to deal with temptation, right? It's not easy as it sounds. There is much deeper kind of problem or confusion with regards why temptation is always attractive, why temptation is always seductive, pleasurable. Okay? So, we have to remember that temptation is always a trial, a test, we call it. Man has a free choice. Meaning to say, the temptation happens when, so we will answer the word when, you are caught up between, <laughs> imagine between, in between. Like Jesus, no? He was, he was tempted and tested actually by the scribes and the Pharisees. He was always caught in between for the purpose of looking for something to use against him. Like for example, the Pharisees brought this woman caught in adultery. So he was caught in between. He has no way to escape. Because if we will say we have to condemn that woman, he is actually violating the law of the Romans because they are the only ones who can who can a verdict, who can of make a verdict or a decision or a judgment because they are the ones, of course, under control of even of Israel at that time. So he is somehow making uh, and um, making a decision that is not actually uh, approved or um, that is not allowed to any, especially if you, if, you, if you are not a Roman official. But if he will not say, he is also guilty of violating the law of Moses. So caught between. <laughs> so... What did, he do? what did he do? He rather told them, Who among you who, had, who did not commit any sin is the one to, who, to stone the woman? And also the other, there are other instances that Jesus was caught in between. But us, we are caught in between, between good and evil, true and false. So between confronted with two conflicting situations, or interest, 
there are two. Is it possible, Father, to choose two? I don't know. It depends. Like food and water, of course, you, you choose two. No? You don't only eat food. You have also to drink water. But that's not the case here. The case here is between something that would lead us to, to something higher or another that it would lead us to be more selfish. That is always the conflict. You rather choose to be selfish or choose to be selfless, to serve others, or you choose to preserve yourself and to stay in your comfort zone. That is always the temptation. There are two actually benefit, beneficial situations. So sometimes we find it difficult to discern which one is really noble and with what we call in terms of degree, highest good or more perfect. They are beautiful, but there is one that is more beautiful, right? That they are delicious. <laughs> For example, food. Both are delicious, but you know that, you know, dried fish is also good, delicious, but chicken is more delicious, <laughs> something like that. Isn't it? There, are, there is always what we call degrees. Degrees of beauty, degrees of good, degrees of even evil. That's why even in politics, there, there are degrees. There are both, they are all, they both, for example, both uh, pa um, politicians or candidates have the tendencies, are capable of doing evil. But we know that there, among them, there are people or candidates who are really you know, known to, to do great evil, while the other perhaps can do evil but lesser. That's why in uh, weighing which who, who among them are, who, who among them is, is the right person to be in the office, you have to weigh it uh, by means of whether the person is a lesser or greater evil. <laughs> it's like this. Of course, this is quite critical and uh, complicated, no? What you prefer, uh, for example, a thief. It is lesser when you are just, you know, when the thief will just get your belongings, right? That is lesser evil. But greater evil when, while the person will get your belongings at the same time, shot you, that's greater evil. <laughs> you know, sometimes we have to, to some identify, of course, to scrutinize the situation because, yeah, they are both good or they are both evil, but sometimes, we have no other choice but to choose. Because anyway, one of them will be leading us at the end, whether you both or not. One, one of them will be the one, will be our president or will be our mayor and, and so on and so forth. So con conflicting interests, that is always the temptation, the when of the temptation. But we always prefer the greater good the more beautiful, the more perfect, the more delicious, right? So there, because there is degree. That's why here in the statement, not all that we desire are good and right. According, of course, according to, to our standard, no? And the perspective of Christian goodness and rightness. All that is good and right we don't always like or desire. That is also true. Not all that we desire are good and right. True? I mean, sometimes it is only for our selfish interest and even sometimes it's for our self-destruction eventually. No? And so that's why it's really true. That statement is true. Not all that we desire or we like is good and right. Because I like it, eh? although it is it is prohibited. It is against the commandments. But anyway, I love it, Father. Right? That, that's, that's, that's the problem sometimes. Even myself, no, I can even testify and enumerate the things that I've done before that I desired that literally and obviously it's wrong. But anyway, I like it. So that's the problem. But this is also true that all that is good and right, sometimes 
we do not always like, especially when the Lord said, don't do that. But we know that it is for good, and that that's right. But because we don't like it, we don't feel com comfortable to do it or to embrace it. Okay? And there you go. <laughs> who? <laughs> now the question, who is behind temptation? God is not for sure responsible of tempting us. Why, why evil or bad is always looks ugly? That's why Satan is always ugly. Have you seen the picture of Satan who is <laughs> handsome? <laughs> of course not. At least here, I, I got a picture that is less, more, more, more horrifying, no? Lesser horrifying, hor horrible, no? In its appearance. But if you, re if, you re if you remember, if you realize, have you come to, to think that there is nothing that is ugly that is beautiful or desirable? But the Satan always use something desirable. <laughs> okay? So anything that belongs to Satan is always ugly, empty, lifeless. That's why. Now imagine how does it feel to be in hell. <laughs> I don't know. But that's why. On the, on the, I think on the fifth, fifth Sunday, our topic is about... Um, what is that? Jesus went into hell. That's an interesting topic. Um, hell is lifeless, loveless, <laughs> as in less. Lifeless, loveless, empty, nothing, ugly. So anything that is negative is there. Okay? So, Satan is the father of lies and temptations. So, the author of lies and the father of, of course, temptations, of death. And we can find that in the Gospel of John, chapter 8, verses 45. The father or the author of lies. So, anything that he claims is actually empty and untrue. Okay, so Satan, according to the original word, no? originally, before it was translated into English, devil, Satan, because they are English word, but originally they came from the Greek, no, diabolos, it's a Greek word often translated as devil in English, or in Latin, they direct to devil, which is translated as tempter mm -hmm. or an accuser. <laughs> so imagine, huh? whenever we accuse someone or whenever we accuse ourselves of something which is wrong, which is true, we are actually taking the role and the attitude or the manner of Satan. Anything that is rooted in the attitude of accusing, because sometimes we accuse ourselves of, of, of guilty of something, right? And that is true. And it's just right that we accuse ourselves. But even that word accuse is actually a word of Satan. You cannot find that in the word of the Lord. <laughs> okay? So we have to be careful what we are using. Maybe we are adapting and using the dictionary of Satan. <laughs> <laughs> we cannot find that word in the dictionary, on the Christian dictionary, in, meaning to say, it's from the dictionary of Satan, if you use that word, no, in academics, in learning. Also, a stumbling block, that's why diabolon, diabolos means stumbling block. Anything that blocks you to, to interrupt or to stop you from going and pursuing something. To put asunder or to divide, or another term there, to destroy. Hmm? So anything that is negative is coming from, comes from Satan. That's Satan. And the, we will ask the question, why Father? <laughs> why he is doing that? Uh -huh. 
why he is doing that exactly because he is also very jealous because he was expelled <laughs> expelled by God not really expelled but he decided to withdraw his allegiance to God as a creature mm -hmm. so the issue is in relationship take note someone who was issued in a relationship would always be the cause of problem in a relationship or would always create issues with people who are in good relationship <laughs> i don't know i don't know but i i know a lot of stories or situations uh like that problematic in the relationship what they will share what they will manifest they will create trouble especially that's why you cannot blame children who are troublemakers in the characters because it leads them to a problematic family well you, know, you cannot give what you don't have right if you've been to a family that is religious well basically you will be religious if you've been to a family that is family oriented it's always uh, emphasizing relationship expect that you will long and you will look for 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 that you know experience everywhere that's why no wonder we filipino for, for example we always seek for camaraderie or get together thing and everything and i think that's for even the americans no uh, we always seek what we call connectedness no relationship that you cannot get from a gadget or from a tablet or cell phone or tv <laughs> okay all right so because satan is satan is is very jealous so he would always destroy people who are close to each other aha uh -huh, you are so close huh i will do something to destroy you to to disrupt you and to separate you and now you have an idea why satan is tempting us because he don't want us to be close to god because that's the first definition in the biblical context right we say we saw that a while ago not just to tempt us of anything, but actually it would lead us to be totally away from the Lord in the long run. That's the very purpose of temptation, not just temptation of something without connecting it to faith or to God. No, 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 no. Maybe that's already too far. So Satan doesn't want anyone to come or to stay closer to God because he would always feel jealous. Of course, we human being have that, you know, have that feeling, right? When we feel jealous, what you are thinking of the two persons? <laughs> okay, you, you, you try to like, that's, that's good. This is not good. I need to get that person away from this, from this God or from this other person. I will have to disrupt their relationship, <laughs> something like that. Okay, since he was condemned to eternal emptiness or aloneness, he also wanted everyone to experience the same end. Parang in Tagalog, anong tawag? Damay, damay. <laughs> no, it's like, if it happens to me, it must happen to you also. So that everyone will end this way. He wanted to get revenge. Exactly. And sometimes, that also that is also the tendency of some people. I don't want, I don't want to suffer alone here. We have to suffer all together. <laughs> right? Exactly. And in our human experience, sometimes we feel that way, right? It's not exactly alien to us, this kind of motivation or mentality. Because the way we think sometimes is actually always influenced by a temptation of Satan to think that way, to desire that way. Okay? So now, no one... From St. James, no? Letter of James. No one experiencing temptation would should say, I am being tempted by God. So therefore, we have to clear out that temptation is not coming from the Lord. Because sometimes some people are saying, the Lord is, is testing me, is, is challenging me. 
Maybe that's another term. But it's not exactly negative in a way. But for sure, St. James is telling us that temptation is not coming from God. For God is not subject to temptation to evil. Just to test us to be, for, for us to be destroyed or to be distracted or to suffer? No. And he himself tempts no one. Oh, that's clear. So that's clear already. It's the devil who is the, the responsible of giving us and always testing us. So there are three temptation stories in the Bible, at least, at least, in my own research. <laughs> research. <laughs> uh, great, great uh, personages, okay? Characters like Abraham, Job, and of course, lastly, Jesus, uh, biblically speaking. But of course, currently, each of us are always constantly tempted or tested by the devil. First, Temptation, Abraham, Genesis 22. Uh, of course, this is very, very popular, no? The offering of Abraham, uh, his son, Isaac, right? But before we try to associate God as someone who is very cruel, we have to remember the background of the time. Because there was a moment the other nations really literally made a human sacrifice to their gods. Okay? And I think you can find that in some parts of the Bible, in the Old Testament. Human sacrifice. That's literal. It's not exactly the practice of the Hebrew people, of Abraham for example, but actually, maybe they were tempted to imitate it. To imitate that human sacrifice so that they, they may be perhaps thinking that it will please God. Like how other nations or other tribes, other people offered sacrifice to their concept of God. And no wonder that sometimes it's like, it's like imitating, right? Uh, we people are fan of imitation, diba? Let's say for example, the Filipino are always fan of imitating other countries with regards to lifestyle haircut, or <laughs> whatever. <laughs> pursing, for example, pursing, no? Young people are also fond of pursing themselves, putting the nose, the ears. So imitation, because it's about idol. That's why the word idol is quite negative, no? Why God always don't like idol? Because it's, it's negative. It's referring to others instead of what is due to God. We rather idolize others by copying their practices. Exactly this context is the same like that. That actually it's not a practice of the Hebrew people. Never that they offer human sacrifice. But because perhaps at one point they were really kind of they were really kind of uh, Tired to please God. Maybe this will be the one to please really God. But it sounds that it's, it was God who commanded to offer uh, Isaac, right? But of course, we have to always remember that uh, the, the author is also offering uh, something to manifest the sign of God. Yes, Father. Okay. So, but this story is not so much about, I think, temptation or test. It is actually, it presents to us the very story of great faith. We have also to be careful in terms of uh, reading the text. Because the emphasis sometimes is hidden. And so we have to avoid the temptation of looking at it in a shallow and superficial seeing. Because there is much deeper message that the author is trying to present us. And I think one of that, in the partic in, uh, with regards to the biblical events, is the story of Abraham. 
that the emphasis is not so much about the test, but to really uncover the very faith of Abraham, which is so great. So much so that he is called father of the faith. But later on, it will be, it will be surpassed by the faith of Mary. All right, in the New Testament. But anyway, that's another story. So he was asked to offer God, to offer to God his only son whom he loved. So there is what we call the word here. Okay. Oh, there's a word here, hope against hope, used in the New Testament. What does it mean? The only hope of Abraham actually for his blood and lineage to grow or to pass through, okay, because one of the promises of God to him is to be a great nation, right? Well, how could you have a great, to, be, to have a great nation if the, your only son, you will be offered? No one will continue your, <laughs> your lineage, right? That's why there is a word, hope against hope. So meaning to say, his hope is being sacrificed because of a much greater hope. So we call it degrees. Well, it's hope. That's why with regards to beauty. Well, that's, this is beautiful. But this one is more, much beautiful. Like the degree in terms of uh, English term. What is that? Um, good, better, best. <laughs> right? Okay. So... So many to say, the emphasis here, my dear people, is the faith and the hope of Abraham. That sometimes our hope must grow and must transcend. And what is that? More on the spiritual, not just on the, uh, how do you call that? Physical or uh, mortality. No? That's why sometimes people... If you remember, no, if you heard the story about um, why some parents don't want their children or daughter or son to enter the seminary or convent, because they said, I have the only, this is on my only kaiha and only koiho, so no one will continue our family name. <laughs> so, something like that. See? Very practical. And we cannot blame them because it's also true. But they don't even see the bigger, the higher dignity, and even reward, heavenly reward, if they offer their children to God. But sometimes our concern is just earthly, right? And sometimes one of their concerns is, what will happen to them when they get, get old? No one will take care of them. <laughs> or whatever. Uh, there is no future in, in the seminary or in the convent because my plan to my son or to my daughter is for her to be an engineer. <laughs> so it's a lot of money, right? <laughs> so it's, it's just about earthly. So it's earthly hope versus heavenly hope. See, we have to see the bigger picture of the good things that we, we see sometimes. So the testing of Abraham is about actually this word. So from Romans, used by St. Paul, um, quoting the Old Testament. The event happened during the time of Abraham. Hope does not disappoint. Hope against hope. Okay? Because it, re it presents to us something that is higher and noble. More noble. More good. More perfect more beautiful. So that's the first story about temptation. But it's not so much about temptation, I think. It's so much about to highlight the great faith of Abraham in the midst of this, what we call somehow conflicting no? concern of Abraham. Like he was caught between to spare his son or to offer it to God. But it's not so much about the sacrifice. It's about, rather, to highlight the faith, how, how great was the faith of Abraham. So much so that he was even ready to sacrifice his only hope, his only love, his only life. 
That's the emphasis. Because sometimes the author, the scripture author, writer, would use some kind a hostile kind of, you know, source or means to highlight something. Not really the negative thing or the, the cruel thing, but to highlight something out of it. That's why we have to be careful how to read the Bible because it's not exactly the way we look at it. Okay? That's why we need really someone who more or less generally knowledgeable about the environment, the context, the time, the culture, so on and so forth. So, we have seen, no, out of that cruelty, somehow, the great faith of Abraham. Meaning to say that unless he offered the very, the only, the only hope, the only joy, you will never receive a more promising and overwhelming promise and reward of God. So it's just about letting God lead us. Okay? Another story that is amazing, the story of Job. Okay? The wealthiest man in the East. So more or less the time period. So this is historical, huh? We are not just creating a, a myth. No. Historically. 7th or 5th century BCE. The book of Job. The wealthiest man in the East. <laughs> and a blameless, take note, huh? he did not uh, become rich because of corruption. No. No. <laughs> a blameless and an upright man who feared God so much and avoiding evil. I love this story because once upon a time, as if the devil is so close to God. Because one morning, one day I think, Satan approached God. <laughs> Read the, the book of, of Job. It's an amazing story. I don't know what chapter is that. Uh, let me check. Huh? That ask permission. Satan asked permission from God. <laughs> to test uh, no, Job. Oh my God. So he even asked permission from God. And God permitted him. Oh my gulay. Uh, Job, where are you? Where are you, Job? Book of Job. I don't memorize anymore my Bible. Uh, Jonah, where is that? It's in the in the prophetical books. I don't know, uh, historical books, right? Where are you, Job? Hosea, oh no. Where is he? Is this one? No. Anyway, one time, Satan uh, approached God and asked permission from him if he could test Job. Because he said to, to God, Ah, that Job, ah, this one, I have already, finally. Let me see, huh? One day, when the sons of God meaning to say humanity, came to present themselves before the Lord, Satan also came among them. <laughs> it's chapter 1, verses 6 and following. And the Lord said to Satan, <laughs> this is interesting, Whence do you come? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From roaming the earth and patrolling it. <laughs> so imagine Satan is roaming the earth <laughs> day and night patrolling it okay and the lord said to him to satan have you noticed my servant job and that there is no one on earth like him blameless and upright fearing god and avoiding evil now there comes the, the tempter the, the the words of but satan answered the lord and said is it for nothing that job is god fearing how you not have you not surrounded him and his family and all that that he has with your protection? Oh. He was testing God, no? So you have blessed the work of his hands, and his livestock are spread over the land. But now put forth your hand and touch anything that he has, 
and surely he will blaspheme you to your face. <laughs> so imagine, imagine Satan like he was even first t- testing, no? testing God. <laughs> Job is just, you know, pleasing you because he has everything. But dare you remove something or touch anything that is dear to him. He will blaspheme you to your face. Parang he was testing Satan. <laughs> so, and so we will continue. This is, this is interesting. Okay? And then, but now put forth your hand and your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your power. Oh my God. Only, this is important. So anything can be ruined, can be taken away from us by Satan, but one thing that is, that remains, that even Satan cannot touch, what is that? Only do not lay a hand upon his person. So Satan went forth from the presence of God. Then came first trial. Oh, so we proceed to the first trial. <laughs> First trial, taken away all his possessions and also the death of his children. Imagine, my God. So actually, this is not just temptation. It is actually a tragedy. Imagine, uh, all his possessions. He was four thousand of livestock. It's overwhelming. So the, the first test, say that so that he can prove to God really na after this happened, for sure, uh, Job will blaspheme God to his face. So the first trial. And then, second, because the first, uh, Job did not give in. He did not blaspheme God. He still worshiped God. He still loved God and feared God. So never happened. So, Satan failed. <laughs> Second, I told you, it, like last, last time, uh, tr- temptation would always be there. Not just once, not just thrice, not just ten times. Would always, Satan would always look for an opportunity. The second trial, Job was struck by a bodily disease. No, sore, I don't know, what is that? And then, abandoned by his wife and his three BB, BFF. <laughs> Best friend forever. <laughs> and he was abandoned by his wife. He was actually blamed. And his best friend, his, his friends, his three friends, were actually uh, conscientiz- conscientizing him that he was tell- he, they were telling him, uh, try to remember your past. Maybe you have done something wrong to God. Maybe you, you may just have forgotten it. That why, that's why it happened to you. So they were like, Mocking him and even telling, insisting to him that maybe you are hiding something. Now, instead to console him, instead to, to comfort him, they were even like uh, drag him, <laughs> dragging him to, to, be more, to be more depressed. Oh, there are people like that. No? <laughs> That's why true friends can only be measured when you are in a most terrible and devastating situation. Yet they remained there for you. And here, we will know that what kind of friends these three friends of Job were. So they, were, they abandoned him. So nothing left. And besides, he was, of course, infected with bodily sores. Oh my God. <laughs> so heavy, right? And Job remained sinless. But perhaps he did not blaspheme God. He did not. He was not angry with God. Okay. But perhaps, like us, we may have made a lot of complaints. Even the words of Job, if you remember, if you notice, it sounds like he was not actually blaspheming God, but somehow he was complaining. <laughs> Sounds like that. He was not blaspheming, but complaining. But I think that's fine. Human as we are, we are full of complaints. But blaming is wrong. It's another thing. To blaspheme, 
to condemn and to denounce God, to hate God is another thing. But to complain sometimes, why Lord this way, uh, like that, like that, it's just part of being human. Uh, sometimes we are full of complaints. But all in all, no, uh, Job did not uh, sin. So Satan failed. All right? That's why, like Abraham, after losing everything, surrendering everything, whether in the context of uh, tragedy, no? because it's the story of, of, of Jacob uh, of Job is a tragedy, no? Natural calamities and everything, and then the abandoned by people around those who loved him. But only God remains. But after that, the Lord blessed Job again. Not the same again. But the Lord restored twice. <laughs> like that hope of Abraham. That in the gesture of offering and sacrifice, actually, it did not happen. But that's the only uh, way of the author to present how really great the faith of Abraham. That he was even ready to sacrifice, to offer his only hope, his only love, his only life, Isaac. And he will indeed no, receive the promise. Great nation, to be the father of the nations, and the promised land. Hmm? And here, the same. You see? But you have to undergo so much, you know, loss, something like that. So much letting go. Okay? So the Lord restored twice of the properties of Job. And besides, he got another, he was remarried and with beautiful and handsome children. <laughs> Imagine, I, we thought sometimes that it is all, an end of everything. But in fact, it's just you know, the crucial stage where you are passing through another stage that is even more double. Mm. We have just to see that way. So we have to see and, the, and to imitate the example and attitudes of that stage. At least two persons we mentioned in the Old Testament story of faith. And so about comfort to so Jesus, we already mentioned in last time, no? So the struggle about the story of the Lord. So the story of the Lord is not, of course, not just like any other stories like Job or Abraham. Because we know that the Lord is actually God. So Satan tempting human beings but at the same time, even tempting or testing God. He was actually testing his creator. Imagine if the devil is even you know, so boastful and so arrogant to test God. How much us, how much more, we human beings. Okay? And here, because he entered into human state, expected that he feels the way we feel. Like hunger, thirst. And so, because this is, so the temptation is about three stages, no? Uh, there are, of course, two stages in the temptation of Job. First, extreme stage in the life of uh, Abraham. In, the, in Jesus, of course, these are just uh, what we call first narrative story. Although we know that for sure, after this temptation, there will be other, other opportunities and uh, situations that the devil would always, you know, test Jesus not to fulfill his mission. But here, we have seen the first stage of, of course, temptation is about comfort. So our struggle over hunger for food, appetite, pleasure, or sense. So anything that is referring to our senses. Sense of appetite, sense of pleasure, sense of desire. So everything is under the category of senses. At this time, it's about the sense of hunger. So automatic, what you're going to do when you feel hung hungry, go to the refrigerator and look for food. That's instinct. That it, it doesn't need so much you know, knowledge or intelligence. Because, <laughs> because even animals, when they feel hungry, of course, instinct would tell them oh, there is a grass there. Go and eat the grass. Instinct. 
Mm -hmm. But this time, it's not just too much about king thing. When we say about the great, greater good and greater value, we need to sacrifice or to have some kind of discipline and self-control, abstinence. And of course, abstinence and fasting. That's why Jesus said, Thus, one does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God, as the answer of Jesus to the temptation, to the test of Satan. Okay? And then, there, this is inspired by Photon Shin. There are deeper needs in man that than crushed wheat, and there are greater joys than the full stomach. Right? more deep, more mature, no? very deep. <laughs> That's true, no? There are deeper needs in man than crushed wheat. That's true. Mm -hmm. A mere, so as if Satan is telling Jesus, just be a social reformer. No, because that's actually nowadays that was actually he was actually perceived by his disciples as social reformer like anyone else during his time that's why even that barnabas barabbas ah, the the one in prison in, in 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 exchange to him who do you like to release to be released barabbas or jesus barabbas actually was one of the social social reformer but like any other failed, end up being prisoned and executed. So, as if Satan is suggesting, be a mere social reformer who caters only to the belly. <laughs> so feeding, that only matters sometimes to people. Just bread for the stomach, not bread for the soul. That's why our desire really with Father, with, with my community is to at least, well, there are a lot of sources uh, that can nurture your souls, no, and on the internet, okay. But for us here in the, the our ministry here at the Grotto is we try our best to make this Lenten season really fruitful, not just for us, but for everyone. That's why we also try to put it live and, and so on and so forth. For those who are, you know, more, you know, serious to deepen more their their knowledge about the faith. So to be a baker. Instead of a savior, <laughs> I like the term of Potonshino, <laughs> to be a baker. <laughs> yeah, because, oh, you want to make it a bread? Oh, make a bread. A baker. Make it a baker. Not be a savior. <laughs> to be a social reformer instead of a redeemer. Sometimes people are just after, you know, immediate thing. But they don't even dare to dig more. To strive more, to desire more for a more lasting, more enduring, you know. So, filling their bellies instead of their souls. So now, now you see the difference between Satan and Jesus. We are not saying that Jesus is not concerned about our belly, no. We are not saying that. <laughs> but there is much more than what Jesus is actually trying to insist. So the only concern of Satan is about the belly, <laughs> So about the bread, but the concern more than that of Jesus is the soul to be the Redeemer and the Savior. Not just of our belly, but of our very soul. So much deeper, much higher. So for Satan, fasting, self-control, self-denial, self-discipline, and anything related to sacrifice are useless and meaningless. And no one would dare to do that. Especially in today's technological world, everything is instant, everything is easy. Forget it, Father. <laughs> it's like he was saying to Luke, forget it, Jesus. There's an instant way. Social reformer. Second, instant popularity. So instant comfort. Of course, no one, no one would not dare to, to desire to have a social comfort, to, be, to have comfort, no? Of course, we would prefer to be always comfortable. 
But given the fact that we are in the world of stressful and toxic and evil world, always expect discomfort. Okay. Second, <laughs> instant shortcut. Popularity. If you are the son of God, throw yourself down. You know, this is, I can't even imagine myself, I can't even imagine this kind of scenario as if Satan and Jesus were in front of, were on stage in front of, what's that guy? Simon. <laughs> Simon and company. AGT. <laughs> as if they, they were performing, right? <laughs> Okay, throw yourself. This, that's spectacular. <laughs> I don't know what's edition right now. It's like an, uh, an open place. That's why pe uh, performers are really doing the flying. <laughs> they are flying and everything. So that they will really be get the, you know, the yes and the buzzer beater of the judges. Because how, that's how to win, not just the judges, but the crowd. That's why the word of, well, anyway, you are son of God anyway. You can throw yourself so that when people around the temple going there will see you not unharmed when you reach the ground, then they will, ah, oh. <laughs> isn't it, right? Instead of sacrifice, fasting, or serving others like healing the sick, very manually, very ordinary, and very uncomfortable, just in order for you to win, to win people's attentions and support, do something spectacular. It's like on the stage. It's just a show, entertainment. Oh, right? I think Satan is very nice, no? <laughs> but anyway, but sometimes that's also the way we want to be popular, especially people who want always to be recognized, right? They always try something that is unique, uh, peculiar, and sometimes weird. <laughs> So that you will have many likes, subscription, and heart, whatever. Okay? Follow my page and everything. Okay? So, as a pretext, Satan even used the biblical term. We already mentioned that last time, no? That even Satan can use as a reference the Bible. Use the word of God against God. Just to destroy God, something like that. To test God. Okay, so my meaning to say, my dear people, temptation is always good, and never that you have a temptation that is ugly. It's almost even perfect, excellent, not just the minimal good, but it's almost so perfect. That's why temptation is so great. Temptation, so temptation to follow, to believe, to admire only the popular. The great performers on stage or in front of the camera. That's the ball game of today. That's why who wins are those who are always in front of the camera. So it's no longer about credibility. It's already popularity. <laughs> That's why uh, in the Philippines, no, the, the election will is uh, is approaching, no, and on May. So those who will win or will, would always be those who are popular on TV, because you are always on TV, but in regards to, to credibility and capacity, I don't know. But our society is always, you know, uh, oriented and conditioned by that kind of thing, kind of education. It's so sad. No longer people dare to go to the library and read a book. And for them, history is just a piece of a slide. It's like this. If you are good in, how do you call that? In photoshopping, in Photoshop, kind of making things in the PowerPoint presentation. That's how this, how, how can you, how can you present history in a one slide of <laughs> PowerPoint presentation? <laughs> Terrible kind of source of knowledge and information with regards to history. And that's what's happening in the world, especially in the Philippines, sad to say. Speaking about ambition, James and John, one example that we can say, indeed, although most all of them are ambitious, but at least those who were really brave enough to express <laughs> their desire were 
James and Jan. To easily be on the power. So it is the spectacular that people want, not the divine. People are always bored. I don't know, that's true. Huh? That's why even in the performance, even in dancing, people nowadays, young people, don't anymore dance just by one song. They, they, they cut the songs, like, yeah, the, the, like, like the hip-hop songs, into different clips, so much so that it's like, the, like seconds, no, five seconds, then another song. <laughs> you notice that? Because the feeling of boredom is so great, so much so that you cannot anymore stay for a short time just to finish it. You want already another, another genre, another, another theme, or I don't know, another desire, another lifestyle, another boyfriend, another girlfriend, or everything, another partner, everything. Oh my God. <laughs> it's a disaster nowadays. All right? So because we feel bored. There is no sense of commitment and fidelity. I don't know. And even us, no? Even in career. After some time, they already get tired and bored of their career, and so they transfer to another career. That's what's going on in the world, I don't know. So the great ones are those who lovingly embrace their daily crosses. That's the great people, especially those who are not in the camera, not in the front page of the tabloid or newspaper, the Oregonian newspaper. <laughs> they are not there. <laughs> they are ordinary people, and most of them are parents who labor day and night for the good of their children. These are the great ones. And perhaps we are one of them. And yet we are not at least given a chance to be at least have a space in the tabloid one day. <laughs> Don't wait for that, for, you to be, for us to be great. No. Because there is a God who is always there to appreciate what we are doing. That's what the most important. That's where we have to rely our greatness from the Lord, not from the world. Mm -hmm. So what is greatness? Uh -huh. We're almost, almost there. <laughs> so what is true greatness in the biblical sense? Oh, see? First is self-denial from Mark. This is discipleship, huh? Second is to be last servant of all and receives all, especially the least one. This is from these sources, huh? gospel. The third is to imitate the Lord because he said in Mark, for the Son of Man did not come to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. That is to be great in the eyes of God, not in the eyes of the CNN, of the Hollywood or whatever, but in the eyes of the Lord. But we need to undergo this. Because this is the process. No shortcut. So power, all shall be given to you if you prostrate and worship me. So what's the issue here? Totalitarian power. According to Satan, for you to control everything, you have to show your power. Like Russia, your military power to dominate the smaller countries. To worship Satan, or the world all power is to serve and to serve him is slavery not really serve out of love and sometimes that's what we seek yes but we end up being slave eventually not really free totalitarian ideology so satan is very active nowadays no totalitarian government oh my god so true power of god is oh see again very opposite power of the cross sacrifice no selflessness for the sake of others and even as a lamb that's why if you see that's exactly the point why we are celebrating the mass 
Because Jesus is our body. A sacrifice, like a lamb. That we always receive in the Eucharist. And the cross that that gives life. Not the power like of, of machines or guns that kills. But the power of the cross that saves and brings life eternal. Mm -hmm. So love through service. The way to attain lasting happiness, therefore, to be great is to reach to be rich and powerful is love again through the cross. There is always a continuation. Love through the cross. This one. And cross can signify anything that make us suffer or have sex, self sacrifice and uh, you know escaping from selfishness for the sake of others. For the sake of our loved ones, for example. That is always. No other way. There is no shortcut or instant way to Christian love. But, again, through the cross again. And the last, blessed is the man who perseveres in temptation, for when he has proved, he will receive the crown of life that Christ promised to those who love him. Not from the world. And so therefore, there is no shortcut to win people. Remember that. It's not a pageant. It's not a stage play. It's not an AGT kind of show to win the majority. No. No shortcut. To win people, sometimes you need to sacrifice. You don't need the camera. You don't need the media to win people. There is no shortcut to love. We know that. That we need to sometimes suffer because we love. There is no shortcut to salvation, like others think. No, no shortcut. There is no shortcut to God, but again, through Jesus Christ, through his cross. Amen. So, thank you. <laughs> thank you, thank you. And uh, see you next time. <laughs> Thank you, Lord, for this uh, successful uh, opportunity to we have given us. Um, it's not so much about the number. It's about being always in our desire to, to follow you. So we end, we end this uh, session with a short prayer. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Then in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Thank you sisters. Father. Thank you. See you next time, God willing. Yeah. Thursday, Bible study, and Saturday. I don't know if it's still me, maybe. Mm -hmm.